intellectuals who state, and I quote, this is the Russian Congress of Intellectuals, our position is simple, Russia does not need a war with Ukraine and the West. Such a war is devoid of legitimacy and has no moral basis, end of quote. Uh, this is a very brave statement made uh, by Russian intellectuals. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, as I speak today, Europe, for the first time in almost 80 years, is faced with the threat of a major invasion. A large nation threatens a smaller, less powerful neighbor, surrounding it on three sides with well over 100,000 troops, as well as tanks and artillery. My colleagues, as we have painfully learned, wars have unintended consequences. They rarely turn out the way the planners and experts tell us they will. Just ask the officials who provided rosy scenarios for the wars in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, only to be proven horribly wrong. Just ask the mothers of the soldiers who were killed or wounded in action during those wars. Just ask the families of the millions of civilians who became collateral damage in those wars. War in Vietnam cost us 59,000 American deaths and many others who came home wounded in body and spirit. The casualties in Vietnam, Laos, in Cambodia are almost incalculable, but they are in the millions. In Afghanistan, what began as a response to the horrific attack against us on 9-11-2001 eventually became a 20-year war, costing us $2 trillion and over 3,500 Americans who were killed, not to mention tens of thousands of Afghan civilians. George W. Bush claimed in 2003 that the United States had, quote, put the Taliban out of business forever, end of quote. Well, not quite the case. The Taliban is in power today. The war in Iraq, which was sold to the American people by stroking fear of a mushroom cloud from Iraq's non-existent weapons of mass destruction, led to the deaths of some 4,500 U.S. troops and the wounding, physical and emotional, of tens of thousands of others. It led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, the displacement of over 5 million people, and regional destabilization whose consequences the world continues to grapple with today. In other words, despite all of the rosy scenarios we heard for those foreign policy and military interventions, it turned out that the experts were wrong and millions of innocent people paid the price. That is why we must do everything possible to find a diplomatic resolution to prevent what would be an enormously destructive war in Ukraine. No one knows exactly what the human costs of such a war would be. There are estimates, however, that come from our own military and intelligent community that there could be over 50,000 civilian casualties in Ukraine, not to mention millions of refugees flooding neighboring countries as they flee what could be the worst European conflict since World War II. 
In addition, of course, there would be many thousands of deaths within the Ukrainian and Russian militaries. There is also the possibility that this regional war could escalate to other parts of Europe, a continent with many nuclear weapons. And what might happen then is beyond imagination. But that's not all. The sanctions against Russia that would be imposed as a consequence of its actions and Russians' threatened response to those sanctions could result in massive economic upheaval with impacts on energy and gas and oil prices in our country, banking, food supplies, and the day-to-day -day needs of ordinary people throughout the entire world. It is likely that Russians will not be the only people suffering from sanctions. They would be felt throughout Europe. They would be felt right here in the United States and likely around the world. And by the way, and we haven't discussed this terribly much, at a time when the scientific community tells us that climate change is an existential threat to the planet, any hope of international cooperation to address global climate change and to address future pandemics would likely suffer a major setback. Mr. President, it should be absolutely clear about who is most responsible for the looming crisis, and that is Russian President Vladimir Putin. Having already seized parts of Ukraine in 2014, Putin now threatens to take over the entire country and destroy Ukrainian democracy. There should be no disagreement that that behavior is totally unacceptable. In my view, we must unequivocally support the sovereignty of Ukraine and make clear that the international community will impose severe consequences on Putin and his fellow oligarchs if he does not change course. With that said, Mr. President, I am extremely concerned when I hear the familiar drumbeats in Washington, the bellicose rhetoric that gets amplified before every war, demanding that we must show strength, demanding that we must get tough, demanding that we must not engage in appeasement. A simplistic refusal to recognize the complex roots of the tensions in the region undermines the ability of negotiators to reach a peaceful resolution. Now, I know it is not very popular, or politically correct, I guess, in Washington, to consider the perspectives of our adversaries. But I think it's important that we do so if we are going to formulate good policy. I think it is helpful to consider this. One of the precipitating factors of this crisis, one, not the only one, at least from Russia's perspective, is the prospect of an enhanced security relationship between Ukraine and the United States and Western Europe, including what Russia sees as the threat of Ukraine joining the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, NATO, a military alliance originally created in 1949 to confront the Soviet Union. It is good to know some history. When Ukraine became independent after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, 1991 Russian leaders made clear their concerns about the prospect of former Soviet states becoming part of NATO and positioning hostile military forces along Russia's border. 
U.S. officials recognize these concerns as legitimate at the time. <coughs> One of those officials was William Perry, who served as Defense Secretary under President Bill Clinton. In a 2017 interview, Perry said, and I quote, this is Defense Secretary under Bill Clinton, quote, in the last few years, most of the blame can be pointed at the actions that Putin has taken. But in the early years, I have to say that the United States deserves much of the blame. Further quote, our first action that really set us off in a bad direction was when NATO started to expand, bringing in Eastern European nations, some of them bordering Russia. That is former Secretary of State William Perry. Another U.S. official who acknowledged these concerns is former U.S. diplomat Bill Burns, who is now head of the CIA in the Biden administration. In his memoir, Burns quotes a memo he wrote while serving as counselor for political affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in 1995, and I quote, hostility to early NATO expansion is almost universally felt across the domestic political spectrum here, end quote. Over 10 years later in 2008, Burns wrote in a memo to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and I quote, Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. In more than two and a half years of conversations with key Russian players, I have yet to find anyone who views Ukraine in NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests, end of quote. So again, these concerns were not just invented yesterday by Putin out of thin air. Clearly, invasion by Russia is not an answer. Neither is intransigence by NATO. It is important to recognize, for example, that Finland, one of the most developed and democratic countries in the world, borders Russia and has chosen not to be a member of NATO. Sweden and Austria are other examples of prosperous and democratic countries that have made the same choice. Mr. President, Vladimir Putin may be a liar and a demagogue, but it is hypocritical <clears throat> for the United States to insist that we, as a nation, do not accept the principle of spheres of influence. For the last 200 years, our country has operated under the Monroe Doctrine, embracing the principle that as the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere, the United States has the right, according to the United States, to intervene against any country that might threaten our alleged interests. That's United States policy. And under this doctrine, the United States has undermined and overthrown at least a dozen countries throughout Latin America, Central America, and the Caribbean. As many might recall, in 1962, we came to the brink of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Now, why was that? Why did we almost come to the brink of nuclear war with the Soviet Union? Well, we did that in response to the placement of Soviet missiles in Cuba 90 miles from our shore. And the Kennedy administration saw that as an unacceptable threat to national security. We said it is unacceptable for a hostile country to have a significant military presence 90 miles away from our shore. And let us be clear, the Monroe Doctrine is not ancient history. 
as recently as 2018, Donald Trump's Secretary of State Rex Tillerson called the Monroe Doctrine, quote, as relevant today as it was the day it was written, end quote. In 2019, former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton declared, quote, the Monroe Doctrine is alive and well, end quote. To put it simply, even if Russia was not ruled by a corrupt, oligarchic, authoritarian leader like Vladimir Putin, Russia, like the United States, would still have an interest in the security policies of its neighbors. And I want people to think about this. Does anyone really believe that the United States would not have something to say if, for example, Mexico or Cuba or any country in Central or Latin America what to form a military alliance with the U.S. adversary. Do you think that members of Congress would stand up and say, well, you know, Mexico is an independent country. They have the right to do anything they want. I doubt that very much. Mr. President, countries should be free <clears throat> to make their own foreign policy choices. But making those choices wisely requires a serious consideration of the costs and benefits. The fact is that the U.S. and Ukraine <coughs> entering into a deeper security relationship is likely to have some very serious costs for both countries. Mr. President, I believe that we must vigorously support the ongoing diplomatic efforts of the Biden administration to de-escalate this crisis. I believe we must reaffirm Ukrainian independence and sovereignty, and we must make clear to Putin and his gang of oligarchs that they will face major consequences should he continue down the current path. My colleagues, we must never forget the horrors that a war in the region would cause and must do everything possible to achieve a realistic and mutually agreeable resolution, one that is acceptable to Ukraine, Russia, the United States, and our European allies, and that prevents what could be the worst European war since World War II. That approach is not weakness, it is not appeasement, bringing people together to resolve conflicts without war is strength, and it is the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. President. Yield the floor. Mr. President. Majority Whip. Mr. President, I have six requests for committees to meet during today's session in the Senate. They have the approval of the majority and minority leaders. Mr. President, I listened carefully to the remarks of my friend and colleague, Senator Sanders of Vermont. I read his uh, published article in the Guardian newspaper yesterday, and uh, it uh, paralleled many of the things which he said on the floor today. Uh, 